Welcome to the Travel Pulse Podcast. Here's your host, Mark Murphy. Hey, it's Mark Murphy back with the Travel Pulse Podcast, the intersection of travel, politics, finance, because guess what? Travel touches everything. So this week, again, I'm a freaking slacker, man. I am such a slacker. I have been running around living on planes for Gosh, it seems like forever at this point. You know, normally August is a quiet month. Guess what? Wasn't for me. I I was traveling the, almost the entire month. I've been traveling pretty much the entire month of September. And I sit here today, Wednesday morning, trying to get this podcast in before what? Oh, yeah, another flight. Luckily today, I can't bitch about pre-check. I have pre-check, but I can bitch about the fact that I'm helping my uh, – my guy, Chris Hunt, down in um, Mexico, because he's going to meet me in Mexico, and we're going to shoot some more footage. Uh, I graciously offered to go and uh, have him order some stuff up here, like the new Mavic 2 drone, the Pro, and uh, bring it to him. I just didn't know that freaking Chris was going to ha- you know, order the drone, uh, have me bring a boom mic, uh, a special thing called the sky, whatever, you know, the sky view so you can see it better it's a, you know, on your control. I, I don't want to bore you with all the details. Suffice it to say, I got a freaking bag filled with stuff. So instead of having my typical carry on and zoom, zoom, now I got to check my damn bag. You know what that's going to mean? When I come back to Philadelphia, it's great going into Mexico. The bag is out before I even get through immigration. I, I, they do it fantastically at Cancun Airport. Coming back. I'm going to I'm going to clock it. It'll be a week from today that I land in the evening. And I'm going to tell you that I'll be shocked if that bag is out in less than 45 minutes. I'll be shocked. And that's where global entry does not pay because you go through immigration in a second and you stand there and you wait and you wait and you wait. And then it eventually comes out. So, yo, PHL. Come on, man. Show the folks that check bags some love and get that stuff out the frickin' door. But anyway, that's where I'm off to. So, yeah, I'm a day late again. I always try to get this in by Tuesday, but I'm a day late again. But we've got some great stuff to cover. Um, first, a quick update on my rental car debacle last week at the sixth rental car location in Pompano. We uh, tweeted it out. We tagged six. We got a direct, well, I got a direct message from Six telling me that, you know, hey, they understand that it didn't go well and, you know, you know, basically DM them to get them, re- get it rebooked. Well, you know, this is travel, folks. You know, I'm not sitting there saying, geez, I might run a car at some point in the future. And uh, whenever you guys can get around to it, yeah, please rebook me and make it right. No, it has nothing to do with it. If they actually listen to the damn podcast, it has to do with your corporate freaking policy. And I still don't have an answer over a week later. And I'm still going, hold on a second, folks. It was a direct thing. Guess what? Uh, bad experience. Is it the branch? Is it the employee? Is it corporate policy? If you didn't listen to last week, it was basically I showed up the car that I had reserved 20 minutes earlier, wasn't there. That's cool. You know, because they, they always have that disclaimer or something comparable. And then they basically said, all we got is a big ass Yukon XL, but we're going to charge you 40 percent more for it. And after standing around for 25 minutes, I just said the hell with it. Five minutes before they closed, I hopped back on my electric skateboard. Shout out M1 inboard technology and uh, cruised back on my electric skateboard and went without a freaking car. Good news is I don't need a freaking rental car because my Jeep Wrangler showed up on Friday night last week on the flatbed from Philly. So we got wheels down there, at least one car. So we're good to go. But I come to you today because I'm up at my office location outside of Philadelphia. And uh, hence why I'm flying out of Philly to Cancun. The clock is ticking though. And I got to get my ass in the shower. I got to get my wrist bags. I got a pool table in my house. It's covered with electronics and crap that needs to go down for this video shoot in Mexico. And uh, looking forward to bringing you back some first-person perspectives on travel to Mexico. Uh, We're going to be releasing some of the videos from a week and a half ago this week, actually later today on TravelPulse.com. And uh, stay tuned for that. Look out for those. And uh, 
and so be it. You know, that is what it is. But anyway, no update from six other than they offered to rebook me. And then I got another message. I think it was yesterday about, you know, management, blah, blah, blah. And again, it's, it's, it's almost like they think I just want to rebook. You know, they want to quote handle my complaint. I'm just thinking, all I, know, all I need, folks, is your damn corporate policy. Seriously? You, when, you, when, you, when you book a car that you don't have and the only thing you have is more expensive, do you eat the difference in cost as a rental car company or do you force the client who booked in good faith to pay the higher thing or walk out the door without the car? That's it. Let me know. Again, willing to bring it to you, willing to clarify it, but you got to get me a freaking answer. So we'll tag you again. See what happens. All right. Um, here's the next thing. TripAdvisor. Well, we heard about the guy going to jail for TripAdvisor. Fake reviews. He was getting paid by hotels to write positive reviews for them. He got nine months in jail and an eight thousand euro fine for doing that. But what about the pro what about the companies that are posting and paying for these or haven't posted uh, these fake reviews? Well, there's something called fake spots, and they have some research that they put out, and they're basically saying that. Um, one third, one third of all TripAdvisor reviews are fake, fake reviews. These are the reviews that you as a traveler use to validate your decision to take that precious week or two weeks or three night vacation getaway and confirm that, wow, that travel agent made that recommendation. Yes, good recommendation. Or you're doing it on your own. You know, you're flying solo and you're saying to yourself, OK, yeah, I'm smart. I'm a genius. Look, I validated that review. My issue with review sites has always been my five star is not your five star. My three star is not your three star. There's no context. Right. So if you got a guy who lives in a trailer, I mean, I got an RV. If I was living in my RV and I got out to stay at a 250 square foot hotel room, with a shower that I could run as long as I wanted, as opposed to boondocking in my RV where I'm taking like a two minute shower, boom, boom, you know, you know, wet yourself, you know, turn it off, soap yourself, turn it on, rinse as fast as you can. Cause guess what? You only got 27 gallons of water in my RV. Um, you're very limited. So yeah, that would be like the lap of luxury, but. If I'm used to living in a 5,000 square foot of house with six bedrooms and five bathrooms and marble this and marble that, and I show up at a resort that completely sucks, yeah, that yeah, I, I'm going to have a different perspective. So it's all about context, but that is separate from all the fake reviews. So with that said, you know, this analysis says tens of thousands of reviews on the site that show top rated you know, for instance, bed and breakfast, they have twice as many fake reviews as lower ranked establishments. And in order to validate this, right, they wanted to go out and, and, and investigate it. And so the Times, um, I think it's the Times of London. I, I, I'm not even. Yeah. You know, yeah. So the Times. Let's see. Let me just double check that for you real fast here. So, yeah, the investigation is from the Times. It is saying that one, uh, yeah, 30%, 30, 32.9 to be exact, 33%, one third are fake. And they basically said that they set up a fake uh, website offering fake reviews and restaurants, hotels, you know, were sending emails in. And for instance, one of them requested uh, by saying, I'm looking to improve my TripAdvisor account. I'm currently 3.5 out of five and would like to be 4.5 in the next month. Please let me know if you can help. So they use an algorithm to catch these suspicious reviews. Um, you can't do that as a user, but you need to understand that a lot of these folks are doing this. And it's really a shame because it really skews stuff and makes it very, very uh, challenging, I think, for um, users to understand what's real and what's not. Hence why I tell you, call on a travel expert, a travel agent, especially if you're going to spend any significant money. I mean, it's one thing to go and you know, look at a bad, uh, a fake review of a restaurant and go just have, you know, a less than satisfying meal and spend 50 or 60 bucks. At the same time, um, it's a much different story when you're spending three or $4,000, including airfare, uh, dollars out the window 
for a less than satisfactory experience. And on top of that, you're not going to get that week or two weeks back that you just uh, you just used. And that's, I think, for Americans who only get a couple weeks vacation, in any case, don't even use it all. That's the biggest challenge. So so that's kind of what we're looking at um, from the standpoint of fake reviews. And, you know, fake reviews and social media kind of lead me to what? Uh, how about fake Instagram photos? Now, you may have heard about this uh, lady who caused a little bit of a stir with some people. I, I'm not really sure why, uh, but she was on a flight in first class and she posted a photo. And this is according to the Daily Mail. Her photo sparked some, quote, mild Internet outrage because it was completely staged. Now, case in point, she basically was sitting in a first class seat that goes flat, but she had turned herself around and she was sitting where your feet go. No one would sit this way because that's not how the seats are designed. It's much more narrow where the feet go. So she's sitting in that direction. She has this lovely blanket covering her and there's this amazing glow because she has these little LED lights. I, I, I've used them before. They're like accent lights. You can use them around Christmas. You can put them across your mantle. Or hell, you can put them wherever you want. They're like indoor LED lights, low voltage lights. And they run off of a little, like in, in the case of the ones I've seen, a couple of AA batteries. So she's like sparkled herself. <laughs> Looks like little stars that are lit up on the on the blanket. She's sipping a, a um, you know, a flute of champagne as she gazes longingly out the window. Cool, great, totally staged, totally fake. That's not how you fly. That's not how you're gonna, you're gonna travel in first class. However, it's a, you know, it's, it's a great looking photo. It's a fantastic looking photo. Now her name is Harimao, H-A-R-I-M-A-O, Lee. Last name Lee, Harimao Lee, I'm, I'm trying to pronounce it, I, I don't know. Um, you guys figured it out, but that's her um, Instagram. So check it out. She got almost 19,000 likes, probably well over that at this point in time. But of course, people are, you know, harping on it. And I look at that, but then I think about influencers overall. Like what makes you an influencer? Is it a huge following? Well, remember I talked about the TripAdvisor fake reviews just a minute ago? Uh, a lot of these folks that have large followings on social media, a lot of those followers are fake. They actually go out and buy them. You can go buy followers. You can go buy likes. You can go buy fans, everything else. It's about the engagement. It's about how active they are engaging with people on social media. And when it comes to travel, everybody wants to be a travel influencer because case in point, this lady did she get that airline seat for free because she has, quote, a large following and she's going to post some photos about her experience in the air? I've seen it. Uh, one of the uh, Kardashians came to the first breathless opening in Punta Cana. And if I recall properly, because of her large social media following, and we're talking large and it's gotten a lot larger since then, they paid her the equivalent of a quarter of a million dollars. And I believe they also covered her private jet travel down and back for her to show her face for 45 minutes. And to also tweet about it and to post pictures, et cetera. Now, the idea was that that would stimulate demand for travel. Nobody knows whether it did or didn't, but I have, that was like five, six years ago. I don't think they've ever done that again uh, with any of their other brands. So my guess is the folks at AM Resorts spent that money. It was a hipster new, you know, kind of cool, cool, um, sophisticated brand called Breathless. They were grand opening. I was there for it. And I was like, wow, that's a lot of money for 45 minutes. But hey, you know, it's not my money to spend. And as it turns out, um, since they haven't, or at least I haven't seen it and I'm in the business, since they haven't done it again, my guess is they didn't really see a result from it. Um, and that leads me to influencers overall and some of the stuff I'm seeing from so-called influencers in travel. Now, if you are a travel um, person and you understand travel and you've been places and you're not just sitting there posing for freaking pictures and you actually get into the destination, you understand the destination, you've got kind of like a global view, then I believe you have the ability to communicate that and certainly educate and influence people that want to learn more about travel. 
At the same time, when I look at that, I say to myself, well, hold on a second. Um, when Mexico and uh, one of the clients related to Mexico had five influencers that they were going to, quote, bring down and comp. And just keep in mind, when you see these influencers at a property, they're many cases getting a free vacation in exchange for posting stuff. OK. And in some cases, if they've got a, you know, a, a decent following, they're getting paid in addition to that free experience. The, the thing that I found very ironic with these, quote, influencers was the fact that out of the five that had committed to coming to Mexico, three of them didn't even show up. They didn't come. They didn't, these travel influencers or you know, travel, you know, we're, we're very, very worldly. We, you know, we, we have a big following who loves to see what we're doing, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, they didn't show up. You know, and now the question is, why didn't they show up? You know why they didn't show up? Because they were afraid. It, it, I think it's too dangerous. I'm afraid to go. I'm a big travel influencer, but I'm afraid to go to, to Mexico because it's dangerous. Because I read something about that, that bad things could happen. Seriously, you're a dipshit. You're, you're not an influencer. You're a joke. And it, I mean, if, if you know anything about travel or hell, you can go to the State Department website and look at the damn current update. And you see that the government of the U.S. has deemed it safe to travel to the tourist areas in Mexico. In addition, they allow all government employees based in Mexico to travel in any of those areas with free reign. Free reign. OK. And with all the politics that are going on with regard to Mexico, NAFTA, illegal immigration, yada, yada, yada. And this administration and what's being discussed. The fact that the State Department is still telling their employees to travel freely you know, and use normal caution, which is, let me tell you, safer than traveling in parts of Chicago, Detroit, New York City, L.A., uh, you name it. Any, any, any city in the U.S., East St. Louis, for instance. I mean, come on. Far safer. Like not, e not even in the same ballpark. Like the difference between a war zone and, by the way, a beach in many cases. Now, that is what we're talking about with these influencers. So my message to the travel supplier that thinks that these people are so powerful, and I know that a lot of you don't think that, you know, and if it means giving an empty room to somebody to so they can go post some photos and, and blog about stuff, fantastic, whatever. But doesn't that just tell you something, folks? Doesn't it tell you when you've got these so-called influencers who won't even travel to a destination for what? For fear of the unknown? Well, that's what travel's about. It's about exploring. It's about adventure. And if you have a freaking clue, you would go to that destination and experience it. And that, to me, really screams that you're not really an influencer. And it brings the conversation back to who are the influencers when it comes to travel? The influence, it's not me. It's not me because I'm one freaking person. And it's not some clown that's got a following on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, who's got a blog that people read. No, it's the freaking travel agents across the United States and Canada who can provide an informed decision, an informed recommendation, and can cut through the bullshit and tell you what's really going on. They have relationships with the suppliers. They've been to the property. They've been to the destination. And even if they haven't, They've sent dozens of people there and they garner their feedback. So, you know, it, it's really an interesting time. And I think we're seeing this shift because all you have to understand is when you invite five influencers to Mexico and three of them are 60 percent bail because they've read stuff in USA Today or wherever that was complete crap. It was fake news and they, they don't come. Then, you know. They're, they're, they're as influential as a freaking grape. You know what I mean? Or as I like to say, as interesting as a small soap dish. So something to think about. And I, I just, you know, I just get very frustrated listening to that, listening to, you know, these so-called influencers. It, it, it makes me laugh. So anyway, um, let's get on to something funny. How about um, Cathay Pacific? This is actually kind of funny. So Cathay Pacific... Um, Got some nice uh, attention. I don't know if they wanted it, but you know what? You know what they say? 
even bad publicity can be good publicity. And in, the, in this case, I think that, that that is true. Basically, they got a new paint job and um, they left out a letter in Pacific. They left out the F. So it's Cafe Pacific. Pacific. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, they had to actually uh, redo that. And uh, I, I, I mean, again, how the hell does that happen? I mean, this is a well-known brand. I'm sure that whoever painted the plane has painted the planes as a company many times. It's, it's kind of nuts. But, yeah, they basically um, they basically uh, dropped the uh, dropped the P in Pacific. I'm sorry, sorry, the F in Pacific. And uh, it was it was kind of a funny thing. It went viral on the Internet. But it also. I mean, if you think about it, how many people talked about it on Twitter? How many people saw it on Instagram and other places? How many people shared it? I mean, the reach was probably in the millions for a company that's not top of mind when it comes to travel. If you're in the U.S., in this case, very well known, obviously, in Asia. And if you travel to Asia, it's a great carrier to fly. I've flown them many times to Hong Kong, nonstop from JFK. Great flight. Um, highly recommend the airline. So to me, I think it was I think it was a great great thing for Cafe Pacific. You know, like paint. You know, I think now we're going to see this. I mean, well, hold on a second. Are we going to see this rash of bad airline paint jobs? You know, Southwest Airlines. You know, uh, Jet Lou. <laughs> you know, I, I guess it won't go viral because it already did. But anyway, now continuing on with airlines. Um, We've got uh, we've got what we've got passengers behaving like idiots. And you may have heard about a Delta Airlines flight. Now, this happened a few days ago it was over the weekend. But actually, it was, I don't think it was even over the weekend. I think it was last Friday. The um, the red eye from Salt Lake City to Orlando. You know, someone's going on a family vacation. Let's let's take the kids to Orlando. Let's go and check out Disney and Universal. Universal, wet and wild, and have all this fun, right? Well, yeah, great family, uh, family red eye, except for one guy, Derek Moss. Uh, he got on board the flight. They said he was heavily intoxicated and he asked, um, he asked for a drink on the flight. And at first they weren't going to give him a drink and they decided that, okay, we'll give him a drink, you know, and so he eventually got a drink. And he insisted he would go to sleep afterwards, but um, that didn't happen. And we covered this on TravelPulse.com. What happened was he asked for another drink. He was denied, and then he started harassing the female flight attendant. So a male flight attendant came over and attempted to step in, and that's when this guy went nuts and headbutted the dude, and a fight broke out. I mean, you're 34,000 feet, and there's a fist fight on a, on a freaking airplane. This is insane. And by the way, it's a red eye, and it was over Oklahoma, so. You know, I don't know the exact time of departure, but let's just say it probably took off around 11, 12 o'clock at night. And this probably happened sometime around two or three o'clock in the morning. Like, let's say two, let's say two hours into the flight. It probably happened because they had to um, basically land at uh, Will Rogers World Airport. And so uh, go look that one up. And the Oklahoma City police came in and uh, arrested this guy. So. You're, you're there on a flight. It's one, two o'clock in the morning. You're zoning out and there's a brawl that freaking takes place. That's just nuts. So the pilot did the right thing. He basically took the plane down, got the guy locked up. They delayed the flight in total about two hours. It is what it is. And so, um, you know, the good news is nobody, uh, nobody got uh, hurt other than the flight attendant. I hope he's okay. Um, that we that we've uh, seen in terms of the reporting, and uh, hopefully the guy will uh, will get a pretty stiff penalty. So people understand that alcohol and flights and fights don't really it kind of rhymes actually. Alcohol flights and fights, yeah, they, hey, it works. Um, that doesn't work. The rhyme works, but not the actual fighting on 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 a plane. So yeah, let's 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 let that guy have a big fine. Let's give him a you know I'd say give him like thirty days in jail. And then, um, and then take it from there. See, see what happens next. See, see how um, game people are to be pounding uh, alcohol and getting on planes. So, you know, interesting enough, um, you've got, you know, I don't know, just stuff that happens, you know, all the time in travel. You know, things like that. You, you, you can't predict it. You just go with the flow. 
the plane gets redirected. It sucks if you're on, you know, on your way to a vacation and whatnot, but you'd rather be redirected than have something, you know, literally bring a plane down. But in the case of um, just scheduled things that are coming up for, you know, around themes like, let's say, um, you know, it's October next month, what do you, Halloween. So you start thinking about, geez, like what's out there? So you might have, uh, you know, some eerie celebrations, haunted houses, or if you're Missouri Six Flags, you might hold what they call the coffin challenge. Okay. This, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm not even sure why anybody in the right mind would want to do this. And if you can do this more freaking power to you, I could not do this in a million freaking years. I could never do it. They call it the Fright Fest 30 hour coffin challenge. And on October 13th, they will basically reward people if they can make it 30 hours in a tight ass coffin. Now they're going to give away two 2019 gold season passes, a Fright Fest prize package, two VIP haunted house passes, and a ticket for two to ride the freak train for Freak Unleashed. They'll also be entered in a drawing for a $300 prize. Let me tell you something. The um, coffins are two feet by seven feet. So two feet, two feet across. I mean, you know what? <laughs> it's bigger than an airplane seat in the economy. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it's two by seven. They will be able to have meals, snacks, and drinks, quote, in bed. And then they'll also get a six-minute bathroom break every hour. And if they want, they can take the coffin home, you know, if, if, if they win. Not in a million years. Have you, have you ever had an MRI? I mean, imagine being in an MRI tube for 30 freaking hours. I would lose my shit. I would completely lose my shit. I would be in a straitjacket in a mental ward. I'd make Jack Nicholson look like a clown from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest because I'm Murphy. He was Mick Murphy in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. There is no way in hell I could manage that. And I, that, that is just the craziest promotion. But you know what's, what's even crazier? They put it out there. People are covering it because it's, you know, it's kind of cool news. But there are people that are going to actually do this. They're going to do this. And if you're doing this without medication, more power to you. You would have to sedate me. I mean, literally knock me out and bring me back 30 hours later and one minute, and I can do it. Other than that, no way. Absolutely not. So, yeah, I got to tell you, man, if you're doing this and you get entered into a drawing for a $300 prize, meaning there's no guarantee you're even going to get the 300 bucks. You know, I'll pay for the season passes. I'll pay for the prize package. I'll pay for the haunted house VIP passes. And I'll ride the freak train and freak unleashed on my own dime. There's no way in hell I'm doing a contest for that paltry payout. And even if it was $10 million, I wouldn't freaking do it. I couldn't do it. So, yeah, there are people that will do literally anything. And so last thing is let's talk. Um, let's talk holiday travel. So here's the thing. When you are looking for your holiday travel, think outside the box. Think completely different as to how you may have thought in the past. Instead of doing a beach vacation this Christmas, because guess what? All those beach destinations, they're going to be charging premium prices. The reason they charge premium prices, because they can because there's such freaking demand, they will sell out. And because they will sell out, and the same with cruise, cruises, you know, the Caribbean cruises in particular, they will all sell out and they will sell out at a high, high price. But because you have kids in school and you can't pull them out of school and so on and so forth, you know, between that Thanksgiving and Christmas time frame where things get 50, 60, 70% cheaper, you're going to pay that premium. But have you ever thought about giving your kids a completely different experience altogether? Meaning, instead of taking them to a beach vacation, take them on a cultural vacation and take them on something that you may not have considered in the past. And I'm talking with kids. Um, take your kids on a river cruise. Check out a company called Ama 
AMA Waterways, AMA Waterways. Check them out because the price point drops so dramatically for European river cruises come Christmas break and this time frame because they're not what people are thinking of top of mind. And you've got things like Christmas markets, you've got museums, you've got dining in exotic locations. You're going to expose your kids and your family members to something that in many cases will last a lifetime. It would be an amazing experience for them. And these river cruises will hit multiple countries, multiple cities, villages. You will just get a smorgasbord of ideas and different experiences. And I've seen these cruises sell for three, four, five thousand dollars per person. And I can tell you that in many cases, they're under two thousand dollars per person when it comes to um, a vacation right around that Christmas break. Because, again, it's not what you're thinking of in terms of top of mind. So my tip for the week, check out a river cruise for a Christmas vacation. Bring your mittens, your hat and your your coats because the weather is going to be similar to what it would be in New York. Uh, But again, New York at Christmas is magical. Christmas markets in Europe are beyond magical, and they're on the rivers, and they're there for the taking at a great discounted price and an unbelievable experience. Add on a pre and post stay, and you've got an amazing vacation for less than the cost or a similar cost of a beach vacation at the same time, but with a totally different, um, totally different uh, takeaway for your family members. So that's the tip. I got to get the hell out of Dodge because I got to catch a flight. Holy crap. I just looked at the time. I got to get going. Y'all have a good one. Back to you next week.